Well, Lord, come and uh, give us peace right now. Lord, help my uh, thoughts to uh, slow down, my tongue to slow down. Um, Lord, we have so much to cover today that you have um, invested in me. And and Lord, I just pray that um, the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart would just be pleasing in your sight and that we would all be edified by it in Jesus' name. I hear the train a-coming, it's rolling round the bend. I ain't seen sunshine since I don't know when. I'm stuck in Folsom prison, and time keeps dragging on. That train, it keeps a-rolling on ahead to Rome. So today we're getting to Rome. Did you get that? All right, little Johnny Cash for you. Um, we are going to finish Acts today, guys. We have been doing the book of Acts. We started in the beginning of February, and then, of course, we alternate with Pastor Curtis's teaching. So about four months of Acts, and we're going to cover uh, something like eight chapters today. So buckle in, okay? Put on your seatbelt, get your Bible ready, because we're going to start out in probably Acts chapter 18. We'll get to that in a second. Um, quick overview. Um, why do we read, why do we sing that Folsom Prism? Because from the very beginning of his journey and, act, and his third missionary journey, Paul was already feeling the sense of the Holy Spirit that I have to go back to Jerusalem, even though he had just came from Jerusalem at the end of his second journey, and I have to go to Rome. And he didn't know exactly how those two things were connected, but he had a sense that they were connected. And um, he, uh, that was his prayer everywhere he went. Um, so today we're going to finish third missionary journey, and then his journey to Rome, and then what is a little bit extra biblical, which is the, um, the fifth missionary journey, essentially, his time after Rome, because uh, Luke finished writing the book of Acts before Paul died. So there's more that we can uh, glean from other epistles and, uh, and other historians, even, that came after the gospel writers and the, the New Testament was written. So um, that'll be interesting. So uh, on the beginning of his third missionary journey, okay, so remember at the beginning of his second missionary journey, he wanted to go into Asia and he wanted to go to Ephesus, but the Holy Spirit was blocking him. And at the end of his second missionary journey, he journeyed, uh, he went basically from Corinth back to Ephesus, and he got into Ephesus where he finally, he wanted to go there all along. He finally got there, but he only spent a little bit of time there because he wanted to get back to Jerusalem for the festivals. And, um, and so on the beginning of his third missionary journey, he had fertile ground there. He had churches there, and he's like, I got to go back to Ephesus and, and strengthen those churches and finish what we started there. And so he leaves Antioch, and he goes through the churches that he had started in his first missionary journey. And then he goes to Ephesus, and he stays there for two years. That's a long time for a man that we consider to be super busy, right? Paul, we just think of him as travel, travel, go, go. But he stays there for two years. And then he's going to, after that time, he goes around to the other cities on that bend around the Aegean Sea where he uh, ministered and started churches in the second missionary journey. And then he comes back around the, the border as well, uh, about around the border of the Aegean Sea. Um, so while he's in Ephesus, he writes 1 Corinthians. Uh, Corinthians was one of the last places that he had ministered to on his second journey. And so it was still fresh on his mind, and he still wanted to follow up with them and see how they were doing. Um, also, uh, they had trained up Apollos as another great apostle, and he went from Ephesus to Corinth while they were gone. And so he was wanting to follow up with them and see how uh, things went there with Apollos. Um, while he was in Ephesus, um, we talked about last week in Acts chapter 19 how he met some new believers, and the very first thing he asked them was, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And so we talked about how that was considered part of the, the Christian experience. Salvation is not enough. Uh, I just said this morning in Bible study, salvation gets you to he- or salvation gives you the right to go to heaven, but it's really the baptism of the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to get there, to get through this life to that point, and, and to do the great commission that we're called to. And so... Um, after that experience, um, 
we're just going to talk about a lot of these things, not read a lot of scripture. He uh, cast out a demon. There's the story of the seven sons of Sceva. And they come to him and they said, we were unable to cast out a demon out of this. But let's just read starting, um, we're in Acts chapter 19, verse 13. Okay. By the way, if the idea of uh, casting out demons and, and facing evil and um, addressing evil spirits, if that intimidates you a bit, we're going to have a class on that coming up at the end of November. So you can join us for Sunday school on the 26th of November. Um, but it says, A group of Jews was traveling from town to town casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. And seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, the Sceva was the priest, were doing this. But one time, when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, um, but who are you? And then the man of the, with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence um, that they fled from the house naked and battered. In verse 17, the story of what happened spread quickly through all of Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike, and a solemn fear descended on the city. So um, this is, why, why were they afraid? What were they afraid of? What, the solemn fear descended on the city of Ephesus, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. They, they had a newfound respect for Paul because these demons knew Paul's name, or this demon knew Paul's name, right? And we sometimes um, get on to the seven sons of Sceva saying, well, they, they weren't prayed up, they didn't know Jesus the way they should have, or whatever the case is. Um, but I want to not focus on that part. I want to focus on the part that says in verse 13, you can underline this, it says a group of Jews was traveling from town to town casting out evil spirits. So they had already been doing this. They had already been successful. They had already been using the name of the Lord Jesus. There's another place where the disciples come to Jesus and they say, this person's using your name, should we stop them? And he's like, no, if they're not for us, they're against us. You're right? if, they're in, if they're ministering in the name of Jesus, why should we be upset about what they're doing or how they're doing it? But in this particular case, it didn't work. And they were surprised and beat up. And Paul was... Uh, honored in this way because the demon knew Paul's name and presumably the, the demon was cast out. And, and uh, that led to such a newfound healthy fear, a respect for not just Paul, but this whole Christian movement that it says that they began burning millions of dollars of books and idols. These books were all about witchcraft. It was about their whole like pagan form of religion. And they were, it was a cleansing of the city that happened out of the holiness, out of the, um, let's say, uh, the presence of God through Paul, okay? So it, not only that, <clears throat> this Sunday also, Paul had unusual miracles occur. People were amazed. It says that the, the aprons or the handkerchiefs that he was using in his normal work of tent making, those things, if they came into contact with him, they were that his followers were taking those and then sending them to other places and that those people who came in contact with them would be healed. And Luke calls these unusual miracles. Okay, the word unusual there, I think both means in magnitude or in grandioseness, let's say, like, wow, something that even just touched Paul was causing healing, similar to how the shadow of Peter in Acts chapter 5 was, calling, was causing healing. But also I think it means that it's, unusual in that it's not normative. It's not intended to be the normal way that we pray for people, okay? Now, I don't want to have a, a, a healing ministry where we're mailing out little pamphlets or mailing out, uh, this has been blessed and if you just send five dollars you'll get healed. I don't want to do any of that. But, if there is something that increases somebody's faith, if that something is what is connecting them to the God of healing, then I'm not opposed to that. Okay? This, those handkerchiefs or aprons that were going out to people, that was like a point of grace. It was being sent from the church to the community, to people who needed it. 
right? And so they're unusual, it's not normative, but also whenever we can find ways to connect to the community and increase their faith and give them a connection to the Lord in which they have not had yet, that's, I'm, I'm for that, okay? Blessing bags gives us one opportunity to do that. Sending cards to people, just letting you know that you care, inviting them to church, that is an amazing way to do that, right? Phone calls can do that. Praying over the phone can do that. All right, so then um, he's, he decides it's time to leave and he goes over to uh, Macedonia, to the cities that he had visited in the second journey. And he starts to feel the call to go back to Jerusalem and then to Rome. So look in Acts chapter 19, verse 21. Afterward, Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to go to Macedonia and Achaia before going to Jerusalem. And after that, he said, I must go on to Rome. And he was preparing to sail. Oh, that's the end. Sorry. So... Um, he knew what his future was going to hold. God was revealing this to him prophetically. He didn't know yet how it was going to happen, but very early on in his third missionary journey, he knew it was going to be Jerusalem and then Rome. And that's important that he knows this and is convinced about it because, as we're going to see, there's a lot of people who try to dissuade him from that. Okay. So then he goes um, down. He goes down into uh, Corinth and back through Thessalonica. Remember Thessalonica hated him the first time he was there and um, had a good ministry. He was, he was actually planning to go from Corinth back to Antioch uh, as he had done in the, first, the end of the second missionary journey. But it says in verse 23 that um, they had discovered a plan to kill him. And so following the Holy Spirit, he changed his plans and went around this, the coastline instead of going across the waters. Okay, so Paul is just um, very attuned to the Holy Spirit, not only through his own uh, personal revelation, like I said, with this plan to go to Jerusalem, but also uh, that other people were warning him about these uh, plans to kill him by the Jews. And so that's, he's listening to that, and he's making changes to his plans. And God used all this for good. As he comes back into Troas, getting back into Macedonia, or I'm sorry, into Asia, um, he visits uh, in Troas, and he's giving a long-winded sermon. He's already starting to feel like this might be the last time I'm here. He's, he's having those senses. And so he, he's giving a long sermon to the people in Troas, and one man named Eutychus, he falls asleep. Can anybody relate to that? Long-winded sermons? Fall. He falls asleep, falls out of a third-story window, and, he, and it clearly says that he died. He fell to his death. That would be pretty crushing to me as a pastor. But this is Paul's response. He just goes outside and he says, don't worry, he's alive. And he, 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 he declares healing for, for this Eutychus young man. And they come back and finish his sermon. <laughs> he's not dissuaded. And so here we have a, a recorded instance of Paul resurrecting someone from the dead. He wasn't buried, so I don't know if you call it resurrecting. He raised him to life again, I guess. And so we have scriptural example. And when Jesus says, go and do the things I have done, right? Go and heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, Matthew 10, 8. Uh, Paul and also Peter, because Peter also had an experience of raising a girl from the dead. They took that literally. They walked in obedience and they did this, the things they saw their master doing. I've said that a few times in this study, right? And so let's not back down from the, uh, from the supernatural or the what we think is impossible. It is impossible in the natural, but supernaturally, nothing is impossible. <clears throat> um, so then he makes his way further south. Now, he had just spent two years in Ephesus, and so I'm sure he had a lot of really close relationships with people there. And so he didn't want to go back to Ephesus and um, sp end up spending a long time f saying farewells, okay? And so he actually goes around Ephesus on the return trip, and he goes to Miletus, but he's like, I really have to minister to the elders of the churches in Ephesus. And so he sends a messenger, and they come, the, the church leaders in Ephesus travel 30 miles by foot from Ephesus to Miletus, 
in order to listen to Paul for one day, and then they travel 30 miles back. That's commitment. That is love, right? They had relationship. And while he's with the Ephesus leaders, he's encouraged them, he's encouraging them as a pastor. He's uh, sharing his heart with them. But he's also telling them, I'm going to go to, to uh, Jerusalem. And the people there, they begin to, you know, weep and, and encourage them not to go because they know that the Jews in Jerusalem, they're going to be mean to them. They don't know what's going to happen, but they, they just, they don't want them to go. Um, we're looking at verse... Uh, chapter 21, verse 4. We went ashore, found the local believers, and stayed with them one week. And these believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go on to Jerusalem. I want you to underline in there where it says, these believers prophesied. Okay? It doesn't say that the prophets prophesied. It said that believers prophesied through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So then he goes on, um, he gets around to Tyre. Tyre is all the way over uh, south of Syria, north of Caesarea. So he's getting close to home. And he goes and stays with um, Philip, Philip the evangelist, Philip the deacon, Philip who we saw him last in Acts chapter 8. This was about 25 years earlier. Okay, Philip was one of the We call him Philip Philip the Evangelist. He was the first person to preach the gospel in Samaria. And he preached to the Gentiles, and and the Samarians became saved. And then uh, Peter and John go to Samaria to kind of check it out. They're like, is this legit? You know, how how is Philip doing this? Um, And so Paul stops at Philip's house. Isn't that great to see that reconnection? Um, I don't know if, if he knew Philip before or not, but um, it's good to see Philip brought in. And Philip, he had a supernatural ministry. He was, they, it was says in Acts chapter 8 that he was known for his uh, works of miracles and, and signs and wonders, and that's how people were turning to the Lord. He had received a word of knowledge about, I need you to go towards Gaza, and that's where he met the Ethiopian eunuch, um, the dignitary there and uh, saved him and baptized him. And then in chapter 8, verse 39, um, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly, say suddenly, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. For, so, Azotus is about 19 miles away from where they were, um, where that baptism happened. And he preached his way up to Caesarea, which is where we find him now. But this is one of the recorded instances of teleportation, y'all. He appeared suddenly, or disappeared suddenly, while he was with the Ethiopian. Now, um, some people will... Um, I think it's okay to, the scripture tells us we should desire the spiritual gifts. And I've heard testimonies of, of, of missionaries as their only resort. God has teleported them to other locations. Okay? Um, but I also believe we don't want to major on the minors. We have the Philip teleportation and we have the Jesus teleportation from Emmaus back to the Jerusalem. Um, and, and that's amazing, and we can thank God for that, and we can expect miracles, and I want to do that. Um, but what's even more important is the effect that this had on Philip. And I think maybe one of the reasons why God blessed him so much with miracles, including teleportation, is because he must have had an immense ministry in Caesarea. Um, because it says when he gets there, that in Acts chapter uh, 21, he says um, that his daughters four daughters are all recognized as prophets. They all have the gift of prophecy. And that there's another man named Agabus who is part of their church who also prophesies to Paul. So what I gather from this is that because of Philip's amazing experiences, he was able to foster 
a supernatural culture within Caesarea, in that church, in his church, where the, the gifts of the Spirit were encouraged and where many people operated in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And I want our church to do the same. I want us to follow in that. One of the purposes of our Thursday night worship service called the Armory is because we want that to be a place where people are comfortable exp- um, operating the gifts of the Holy Spirit in ways that they're not used to or seeing things op- happen in the Holy Spirit that they're not used to. And so we're, gonna, we're continuing to grow on that. It's like a laboratory, okay? And uh, I encourage you to come. It's a lot of fun. Thursday nights is just praying and, and singing. There's no, and if anybody has a prophetic word or they want to share scripture, they're welcome to do that. We encourage people to share prayer requests, but there's no sermon time. It's not a normal message, okay? Moving on. So, <clears throat> so finally, um, Paul leaves uh, Tyre and Caesarea, and he gets down to Jerusalem, and this is really interesting. Anybody know what the name Jerusalem means? Ben, uh, Joel? Does anybody know what Jerusalem means? It means city of peace. Okay? And when he gets there, I am way off on slides. When he gets there, the church leaders, they want Paul to demonstrate for the benefit of all the Jews there and the Jewish converts that he still follows the Jewish law. We had a big talk about this with Acts 15, right? What must we do to be saved? What are the requirements for, Jewish, for people converting to Christianity, uh, especially the Gentiles? And... They concluded on the four purity laws and that you can't add anything to Jesus' salvation. Jesus is it. You believe in Jesus, Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's all you need. Um, So when he comes back to Jerusalem, it's not a question of uh, we need you to show that you still believe in Yahweh. They knew that. But they were just concerned because there were so many Jews from surrounding nations like Asia that were there in Jerusalem for the festival that they, they had heard that, Jew, that Paul was basically uh, disgracing the synagogues and all these other places by bringing Gentiles in and by saying that you don't need to follow the law. And, just, um, and so they're, they're like, just to be safe, would you mind going through a cleansing ritual for us? just to show people that you still honor the law. And Paul didn't throw up his hands and be like, that's not necessary. We already talked about this. We went through this already. It's not necessary. He just, he went along with it. And he also said, well, they said, hey, would you also pay for these four others so they can also go through the cleansing ritual? I don't know why, how that's thrown in there, but he he went along with it, okay? And so in this case, he was to shave his head as as part of the... um, the cleansing, the spiritual cleansing. And he had done this voluntarily at the end of the second journey. He went through the same cleansing, the Nazarene ritual, I think it was, a Nazarene vow, and, he, and that includes shaving your head, apparently, at the end of it. Um, but now they're asking him to do it. He goes ahead and do it. That's kind of like, if in case you haven't noticed, I shaved my, my face clean today. Uh, I didn't shave my head, but I wanted to make an illustration here. And I like to shave every now and then. Um, it's kind of like if Rebecca would say, you know, if you just, if you just loved me, if you would just shave your face, you know, it's like the two aren't really related. She knows I love her regardless if I have facial hair or not, but I can, I can agree to acquiesce to that request. I don't need to have a beard, right? Um, and so he, it was an outward sign of, um, Uh, subjugating or just going along with the requests of the Jews in hopes that they would accept him in Jerusalem. By the way, they also say in the same, in verse 20, um, we're in chapter 21, verse 25, as for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food. So remember, they had written to them in Acts chapter 15, and they're now quoting from this again in Acts chapter 21, that Gentiles should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and, and from sexual immorality. 
And so we call these the, the purity laws or the, clen the cleansing, you know. Basically, in order to avoid offense of those who are Christian but come from the Jewish background, we want you to go along with these things just to avoid offense and have peace in your congregations. And there was a question in our sermon about, is this supposed to be applied universally, or is this, was this only for a, a certain time and, and region? And so the, the, uh, the letter was addressed to a very specific set of churches that Paul had just ministered to in his first missionary journey. Here, there's no, con there's no constraint. It doesn't say, the churches that you went to on your third missionary journey, they, have they been doing these things? And so I'm going to revisit that and say that I'm on the side of, I think that these things are for the benefit of everybody. That we, because it's been preached in every synagogue for thousands of years, I think that these things are significant because God considers forgiveness significant and because God used the symbolism of sacrifice for so long, the symbol of blood, that it means something to him. And he wants us to keep that holy. He wants us to remember that the blood of Jesus was holy, right? And of course, sexual immorality, we know that leads to all kinds of evil. So that's a no-brainer. But um, moving on, uh, so then he's, he's appearing now in Jerusalem. He's got his head shaved. They've told him to straighten up and, and he's going to the temple. He's going to offer his, he had brought with him um, alms that he'd collected from all these other churches to give to the church in Jerusalem. But the Jews, primarily from other places, remember they all came into town, it says the Jews from Asia, they start a mob and they start saying, that is the guy that's been disrupting all of our synagogues all over the place. We got to get rid of him. And so there's a mob that attacks Paul in Jerusalem, presumably very near to the temple. And the Roman, there happens to be a Roman commander there, kind of posted to keep peace. And so he grabs Paul because he's afraid for Paul's life, and he also thinks that he's an assassin from Egypt, but that's another story. And, <laughs> and so um, it ends up being that the Roman commander is the one that saves Paul's life and also gives Paul a chance to talk to the mob. And so what do you think he does? In Acts chapter 22, Paul once again goes into his testimony of his road to Damascus and his transformation and the, the power of Jesus and how Jesus was the fulfillment of the laws of the prophet. And the mob doesn't care. <laughs> there, there's just all over him. That, that testimony was unsuccessful at that time. And so the commander arrests him, but not knowing what to do with him because he didn't really break any Roman law, he decides in Acts chapter 22 I'm going to take you before the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish high council, where the high priests are, and let them decide what to do with you. Okay, so in the high council, we have a group of Pharisees and we have a group of Sadducees. They, they're different sects of Judaism. And Paul uh, cleverly incites the two against each other based on the, the doctrine of, of bodily resurrection. And the two get to be fighting over each other so much that they, uh, they I don't know, it gets violent. And, and it, says, it, says, um, it says that the commander actually fears that they're going to tear Paul to pieces. And so again, the, uh, the commander saves Paul's life, takes him back under arrest. And while he's in arrest, the guy, we can't make up their story. There's just like too much drama in this story to be made up. Uh, Paul's nephew learns of a plot to assassinate Paul by the Jews. It's a Jewish plot. And so the commander says, okay, we can't keep Paul in here anymore. It's not safe. So I'm going to ship him off to Caesarea, and um, he'll, he'll be safer there. And, and he can be under trial under Governor uh, Felix. And so that's what happens. Um, before he leaves... <coughs> In, in chapter 22, verse 21, if you can put your finger there, then the Lord said to me, go and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. 22, the crowd listened to Paul until he had said this. Okay, this, this is the arrest. 
And then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. And then 2311, you know, he, he, he failed with the mob, he failed with the Sanhedrin to make any like progress with them and, and saving them, showing them the light. Um, Jesus in 2311 appears to Paul again. It says, the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem so you must also testify about me in Rome. All right, so this is actually, um, man, I'm doing terrible on the slides. Ben, if you can help me out as you see. Um, so that actually concludes the third missionary journey because now he's, he's arrested and now begins the process of him getting to Rome. It's actually a decision made for him uh, to go to Caesarea uh, by the Roman commander. Okay, so he gets to Caesarea, and it's under Governor Felix there. And uh, a, Roman, a, a Roman citizen was not allowed to be held prisoner longer than two years without a just trial. Okay, but Felix wasn't exactly straight and narrow. Um, and so he decides to keep Paul, uh, hoping that Paul will give him a bribe. Hoping that, uh, and also because the Jews were happy that Paul was arrested, and they didn't, they wanted to stay that way. So he's trying to appease the people. Okay, but those that time in Caesarea, those two years, that begins to fulfill a prophecy that Paul had received from Ananias back in Acts nine, when Ananias comes to Paul to heal him. This is God speaking to Ananias, and it says, "Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument." to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings and as well to the people of Israel and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. <clears throat> so he's going to have an opportunity here to present to Governor Felix and then later Governor Festus and then King Agrippa and then finally to the Caesar himself. So that's a, that's a long time, 20 years to wait for those, that promise and that prophecy to come true. But it did it come true. It came true big time, right? Keep that in mind. Um, now let's talk about Governor Felix. Verse, chapter 24, verse 24. Fingers on the chapter. After some days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. As Paul reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to Felix, Felix was afraid, and he answered, Go away for now, and when I have a convenient time, I will call for you. And at the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, and so he sent for him frequently and talked to him. For two years, Paul and Felix had this dialogue about who Jesus was and about what was required to be saved. Felix knew the, the Jewish tradition. He was, I don't know how much faith he had, but he knew uh, what the Jews believed at least. And so the tragedy that we see here with Governor Felix is that he failed to respond to the truth. And he let those earthly influences of money and of power and influence uh, override anything that Paul had to say. If anybody can convince you of the gospel, it's probably Paul. Do you agree? I think he was a pretty convincing guy. But Felix was stonewalled. And there's a lot of people out there, just like it talks about in Romans 1, in the hardness of their heart, they have rejected God. And they're going to reject the gospel. Well, uh, eventually Felix loses his position and, and Governor Festus comes along. Festus realizes, hey, Paul's been in jail too long. We've got we to gotta get this case moved along here. And so he reopens Paul's case and he hears from Paul, chapter 25, and Festus is like, I, I don't see why he's arrested. He didn't break any Roman law. Why is he still in jail? Um, Paul uses this opportunity again to share his testimony. Uh, 
Actually, let me back up. So because, because Festus didn't know what to do with him, he invites King Agrippa, Herod Agrippa. This is um, Herod Agrippa's son that we heard about, the, the, the Herod Agrippa that died from worms back in Max 11, I think it was. Um, so his, his son is now in power, and he comes to visit with his wife, and, and, and Festus asks him, hey, listen to this guy. He's got some weird things to say. Verse, chapter 25, verse 26. When I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and he himself had, appeared, had, had appealed to Augustus, the uh, Caesar at the time, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I brought him out before you, especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after examination has taken place, I might have something to write. So I know what to tell the Caesar to, what he's charged with. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not specify the charges against him. All right, so now the stage is set. Now he has a chance to give his testimony again to both Festus and King Agrippa. And he follows this little outline for his testimony. Very simple. What was his life like before Jesus? He gives all of his credentials. He gives all of the good and bad about being a Pharisee and, pro- and persecuting Christians. Then his encounter with Jesus, right? The blinding light, being humbled, being knocked off his horse, being healed, being ca- commissioned for ministry, and then what his life has been like ever since. This is a three-point outline that everybody should, should memorize because it becomes the basis for our testimony as well. Okay? And when we're delivering our testimony, I want you to remember the three C's. It needs to be clear. They have to be able to understand you. It needs to be concise. We don't want them falling asleep, getting bored, feeling like they have something else to do. And it needs to be Christ-centered. Everything needs to point back to Jesus. Okay? This is not your time to say, well, I really pulled myself by the boots that time, you know. It's got to be glorifying to God. Matthew 5, 16. Okay? So, we want to utilize our own testimonies. Paul used his testimony at least seven times, sharing it with people that he was ministering to. And we need to do the same. He was unsuccessful, even though he had a lot of success in his ministry. Look at this. He was unsuccessful with the Jewish mob. He was unsuccessful at the Sanhedrin. He was unsuccessful with Felix. He was unsuccessful with Festus and Agrippa. But he preached to them. He did not back down. He appealed to Caesar, and he would get to Caesar eventually. We don't need to take the result of what happens when we minister to someone or when we share our testimony personally. We leave that in God's hands, and we are just faithful and obedient when those opportunities arise. Okay? So don't get down. Keep sharing the gospel. He would eventually have great success. And in the book of Philippians, it says that um, I and those in the household of Caesar greet you. That's pretty exciting. <clears throat> we don't know the seeds that we're planting just like the parable of the sower casting out the seeds. Some of them we already know, like, Fe- like Felix, hard ground, not going to work. Some of those seeds might get lodged somewhere, and years later, after the soil's been turned, or after a little extra rain, or whatever the case is, year later, that seed might begin to sprout. And um, although he did not have immediate success in Rome, as we're going to find out, we know eventually Rome, the Roman Empire became a Christian empire. <laughs> God gets the last laugh, amen? All right, so, the, so after Agrippa and, can't decide what to do with him, they said, well, hey, he could have been freed except for he appealed to, Caesar, and appealed to Caesar, and that's his Roman right. So to Rome he will go. And so uh, again, the Roman guards, they put him on a ship this time, and they're going to try to sail him to Rome. But... That, and that starts around 60 A.D. But unfortunately, uh, there's a little bit of a problem. And I don't know how long it was supposed to be, but it ended up being a lot longer trip than they had warranted or expected. And they get shipwrecked on an island called Malta. 
um, through supernatural intervention, words of knowledge, um, great leadership of Paul. Paul saves everybody on the ship in that shipwreck. Um, the people of Malta, they hear the gospel and they're amazed by signs and wonders and many people are healed. And three months later, after the, uh, the winter months had passed, the, 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 the seasons became favorable enough for them to get on another ship and head on to Rome. Okay? So, God did not waste any time. There was, no, there was nothing lost with this uh, journey that, that kind of failed, right? God used every bit of it to glorify himself and to strengthen the ministry of Paul, his witness. So Paul finally gets to Rome. He had already been in prison for two, month, or two years. He's been shipwrecked on an island for three months. He finally gets to prison under Roman guard. I'm sorry, he gets to Rome under Roman guard. And um, thankfully they're favorable to him, so they just send him to a, a house arrest instead of sending him to a, a dungeon or a prison. And he starts inviting, he does what he does, right? He starts inviting the Jewish leaders of that community to begin to talk to him about Jesus. And we're in chapter 28, verse 25. It says, They disagreed among themselves and began to leave Paul after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through the prophet Isaiah, Go to this people and say, you will, ne you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their, their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their ears and hear with their, see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Verse 28, Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. One more disappointment. He finally gets to Rome and the group of religious leaders in there, they, they turn him down. And Paul just says plainly, this was prophesied 700 years plus earlier. This was, this, it's, it breaks his heart, but he's like, I'm going to preach to the Gentiles from here on out. So um, it's an interesting discussion. All of these things that happened to Paul from the time he entered Jerusalem until the time he's in Rome, were those, was that the enemy trying to keep Paul from Caesar? Was that the enemy coming against his ministry? Or was that God just creating opportunity after opportunity to minister to people? It's a rhetorical question. It can be a both and question, Right? God used all these things to show that he had preserved Paul through all those perils and that he is actually an ordained carrier of the ministry of the gospel. We're getting close to the end here of my sermon anyway. Um, so it's ironic that <clears throat> he had so much freedom in his ministry to move around uh, not just Israel, not just Asia, but also into Europe, all the way to Italy. Um, he had 20 years of traveling and preaching freely, and now he's got five years of his life ministering under the guard of Roman soldiers. But he never stopped preaching. Again, God didn't just, that time wasn't lost. It's during his time imprisoned in Rome, under house arrest, that he writes what we call the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Some of the most powerful books that we have in teaching and in church um, leadership and, and, and the gifts of the Spirit and, and just all kinds of things. In Philippians 4.22, it's, again, it says that all the rest of God's people send you greetings too, especially those in Caesar's household. So he had success. He was ministering to perhaps servants in Caesar's household and they were coming to receive Jesus. And we know that eventually he did meet with Emperor Nero because he was acquitted. Nero at that time had not yet gone insane and he was not trying to uh, persecute the, the Christians. And so um, he released Paul and Paul continued his ministry. 
So here's the rest of the story, like NPR, the rest of the story. Um, so he's released from Rome, and he, he's got rubber on the tires. He's ready to go. He is not done. He goes and he strengthens um, Titus's ministry in Crete. Um, here we go. Oh, sorry. He goes to Crete. He works with Titus and the church elders there. Then he goes back to Nicopolis, uh, where he writes the books of Titus and, and 1 Timothy, or the letters. Um, and then this is not fully confirmed, I would say, but there is evidence of that uh, he may have left from there and gone to Spain. And that was definitely his intention. Okay, if you look in Romans fifteen twenty four, which was at least five years prior to this, listen to how, how ironic this is. I am planning to go to Spain, and when I do, I will stop off in Rome. <laughs> and after that, after you have enjoy, we have enjoyed fellowship for a while, you can provide for my journey. And so he didn't know that he's going to be taking the hard route to get to Spain. But what he said in, in Romans 15, 24 was kind of prophetic because he went from Jerusalem to Rome to Spain, didn't he? Now, I don't know where this reference comes from, but that map in the bottom corner says that he actually went from Spain to England. And I, don't, I can't confirm that, and I didn't look it up. So if anybody wants to do any research on that, I'd love to hear about it. But uh, these are excellent maps. It's an excellent resource. And um, so I give it to you for what it is. Um, but like I said, it's extra biblical. So there's other, there's other sources that talk about it, and feel free to research on that. But what we do know is that um, in around 64 of A.D., uh, Rome had a major fire, and the, the scuttle is, is that Emperor Nero caused it himself because he wanted to have a reason to persecute the Jews. Um, I'm sorry, the Christians, not the Jews. Actually, I think Jews, yeah, that's off topic. Um, and so they began arresting Christians and crucifying Christians in Rome, and I don't know when or where Paul was arrested, but at some point he was re-arrested and taken to Rome and appeared to Nero again. Um, prior to doing that, he, was, uh, he wrote to the, the letter of 2 Timothy in around 66 AD. And then that same year, uh, again, extra-biblical sources say that Nero uh, beheaded Paul. When you have Roman sources, it's pretty trustworthy because they were excellent historians. So, that is the rest of the story. And we are done with Acts. So, everybody give yourselves a round of applause. So, we have some declarations I'd like for us to do, but I need some warm-up practice first. I want us to be a church that desires supernatural. We never want to overlook... We don't want to seek the, the gift. We want to seek the giver of the gift, okay? But the giver of the gifts wants us to have the gifts. That's the beauty of it. He wants us to have the spiritual gifts so that we can do the ministry of the church. And so, you know, just like it says, do not quench the spirit. We want to be a place that welcomes the spirit and welcomes the gifts of the spirit. Um, we talked about Paul, I'm sorry, Philip. I like this saying, I, I'm going to credit it to Chris Valentin, I'm not sure if he came up with it or not, and it says that if you want to slay giants, if you want to do the impossible, then you need to hang out with giant slayers. You need to surround yourself with people who are more mature than you in the faith, who have had supernatural testimonies to share, so that your faith and your knowledge of the word can grow. Okay? If we think we know it all and think we've experienced everything that has God for us, you are sadly mistaken. All right? But that also puts an onus, my brothers and sisters who are older than I. We need you guys to lead us in those areas. Okay? We need all of you to desire the gifts of the Spirit and to step out in them. All right? I've also heard it said that um, if you want to slay giants, you need to start with lions and bears. Okay, God, just like the story of the ten talents, you know, God's not going to give us cities to govern and to bring to salvation 
until we can show him that we are faithful in stewarding what he gives us in the little, right? In those 10 talents and see what, he, see what we do with those. So look for those opportunities and let's take them. Um, let us not be like Felix. Let's, let's receive what Jesus has for us quickly. Why, why delay? Why make arguments? Why put it off? Let's practice our testimonies because that it is by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony that we will overcome, right? Testimony has amazing power. I think it would be fun to have a Sunday school series where we just share each other's testimonies and just grow on that. Put some biblical basis to it and grow on that. Um, and then let's continue to preach boldly. So I need everybody to stand and we're going to declare these things out loud. Use a firm voice, okay? We're, co- we're in agreement on these things, are we? Yes? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. All right. We will desire a supernatural culture. We will not defer action and truth. We will practice our testimonies. We will remember the promises of God. And we will preach boldly till the end whether that be rapture or the end of our days, right? Amen? Amen. All right. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. And Lord, we thank you for this study of Acts, and we thank you for the example that you have given to us through our early church fathers. Lord, help us, help us, help us to walk in them so that we can have an impact on our culture today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.